Well, good morning, Stafford Crossing. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. You know, we are saved because of God's amazing grace. But also, He pours out His grace on us every day in different kinds of ways. So I want us to stand together this morning, and I want us to, to declare that amazing grace to Him this morning. Will you sing with me? God, hey, before being seated, we we'll just turn around and greet one another.
All right. Good morning, church. How are we doing today? Good, good. It's good to see all of you guys, whether you're here in the room or online. So excited you've chosen to join us this morning as we worship the Lord together. Uh, really excited to have you here. And hey, if this is your first time ever, uh, maybe a second, third time, or maybe you haven't had a chance to connect with us here at Stafford Crossing, I would love to just direct you to our digital bulletin, which is on the QR code on the uh, pamphlet that was handed to you on your way in. You can go to that, that digital bulletin there, and you can find all things Stafford Crossing are coming up, different events that we're doing, different ministry areas, ways for you to get plugged in. Uh, you can give online through the digital bulletin as well. So I want to invite you guys just to check that out. We do have a handful of really important and exciting things coming up. First and foremost, if you are new here, uh, maybe you can come for a little while, we have our connecting class coming up. This is an opportunity for you just to explore all things Stafford Crossing. If you're excited about coming here, we're certainly excited that you've been coming here. This is an invitation for you guys to sit in to learn more about our history as a church, where we've been, and where we think God is leading us in the future. So I want to encourage you to sign up for that connecting class to just take a step further in your journey here at Stafford Crossing. Next up as well, really exciting, just for all the ladies in the room, is that we have our IF conference coming up this Saturday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. This is an opportunity for all of our ladies here at Stafford Crossing to come together to do a great Bible study together, to get to know one another on a greater level and enjoy each other's company. So I want to invite you guys, there are still some registration slots available. You can grab one of these cards on your way out, register at the QR code on the card, and I look forward to seeing you guys here. Well, I actually won't be here, but I look forward to you guys being here this Saturday, 9 to 5, and all of my other dads here with young kids, we'll, we're on the job on Saturday. Can't wait for that. That's going to be interesting. Uh, next up as well, uh, is our Fusion Fall Retreat. It's called our Kaya Retreat. If that's a new name to you, that is our new name for our different retreats that we do here at Fusion. And so in just a few weeks, our high schoolers are going to be going to Watermark's camp, and we're going to have a ton of fun. We're going to shoot paintballs at each other, and we're going to learn about Jesus with one another. So if you're a high school student in this room, maybe you have a high school student, this is a great opportunity for you to send your high schooler off to a retreat. We're going to spend a lot of time together, have a great time, and there are still some slots available, so I want to encourage you guys to register your high schooler for that. If you have any questions about that, you can find me in the back, or after this service in room 110, we're actually having a Fusion parent information meeting. So that's an opportunity for all the Fusion families to come and just learn more about what it is that we're doing at Fusion and what's coming up next. For now, I want to invite you guys to stand, because we're going to continue worshiping the Lord together. darkness All together, wonderful 
Yes, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. Yes, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that There, we were having a little bit of issues, and it was uh, pretty awesome to be able to pull off these ears and just hear you all singing so beautifully. So I appreciate that. Um, Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, that everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them is like a man building a house who, who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. As a church, it's important that our foundation isn't simply just set on just hearing the words of Jesus. That is great. But we can, we can listen to all the sermons. We can read all the Bible every single day. And we could be listening to the, the greatest podcasts. But if we are not doers of Jesus' words, Jesus goes on to say that the foundation for that person's life will not be strong enough to hold them. So when the waters come against your house, you'll be left in ruin. So when we follow Jesus and live out his teachings, when we are obedient to what he has instructed us to do in life, then we bring him honor and we bring him glory. Our foundation is then strong and secure because it will have been dug deep and built on our solid rock who is Jesus, who is the one who keeps us secure. And so as we sing this next song, let's commit to taking that step in faith every single day to trust our Lord, to trust his words enough to then follow through and be doers of what he has told us, knowing that if he is our foundation, he will not fail, he will not be shaken, and neither will we because he will be the foundation that we have planted our feet firmly on. So let's sing out and let's declare him as our firm foundation. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Everything around me is shaken. 
I've never been more glad I put my faith in Jesus He's never let me down no. He's faithful through generations Yes, He is So why would He fail now? He won't He won't joy in the chaos I've got peace that makes no sense so I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength cause I built my life on Jesus and he's never let me down he's faithful in He won't. He won't. See, he won't fail. Believe this. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't. He won't. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't fail. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. Oh, I've never been more glad. I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would He fail now? He won't He won't He won't fail. He won't fail. God, I just, just pray that we would be, that we would faithfully follow you and trust you in all your ways. Lord, 
we praise you, we praise you. Thank you that we can lean on you, that we can trust you. Lord, I pray that every single day as we are walking and we are trying to make decisions, Lord, I pray that we would trust you and your word and trust your instruction and know that you have us, that you will not leave us, that you will not forsake us. And that includes when we step out in faith, knowing that you are, you are directing our paths. And may you be the one that directs our paths. May we have ears that only listen to your voice, that we would not be deceived and we would not f- fall into that deception when the evil one comes and tries to, to, to speak to us and draw us near to him, Lord, may we be so stuck and may our feet be stuck on you as our foundation. And so, Lord, may we live out the calling that you have placed on our lives. And so, Lord, as uh, Mark comes and brings a message, Lord, I pray now that we would have ears that only are tuned to your voice. Speak through, Mark, speak through your word. And may we be glad in it and may we delight in your instruction. Thank you for being our security and our refuge and our strength. We love you. Pray this in your name. Amen. Now, do not be seated. Actually, stand. We're going to uh, read today's passage in Romans that we'll be studying. Um, this, it will be on the screen as well for us. So we can read along together. This is Romans 4, 1 through 12. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believed without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the, uh, the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. This is the word of the Lord. Y'all may be seated. Good morning. I love that David read that for us so that I'm not the only guy saying circumcised a whole lot (laughs) this morning. More on that later. But I am thankful to be back in our series on Romans, the power of the gospel. Paul has written this letter to the church in Rome, a group of believers gathered together, Jewish believers, Gentile believers. And Paul is just writing this letter that is rich with doctrine, rich with theology, good information for them as a young church and as they're learning how to walk as Christians. And in doing so, Paul has had to spend some time on kind of the bad news that is the first part of the good news. Uh, the, the, The bad news is we are all sinners. We have earned death. We have earned our place under the wrath of God because of our rebellion against him. He spent a good bit of time on that. And then last week and a little bit the week before, we started to catch a a, a glimpse of the good news. Uh, There there is nothing we can do about our position. No good works will rescue us from this place. So God sent Jesus as our rescuer. God sent Jesus to do what we could never do in an effort to restore our, our relationship with God himself. And so Paul, as he's writing this letter, he he uses this device called diatribe. It's where he's sort of set up an imaginary courtroom in his mind. And he's presenting his case. And there's a judge and there's a jury and there's people listening in. And there's also uh, an an opposing counsel. And, And he's guessing, imagining what questions might be asked of him 
in this courtroom. And then he presents his answers to those questions. So he's hearing questions in his mind from his Jewish brothers and sisters. Paul was raised Jewish. He was raised in the community. He was really good at being a Jewish guy. And so he knows, he can recognize probably what his friends would be asking. And so in this case, as he says, nothing, none of our works can rescue us. None of our works can save us. We need Jesus as our rescuer. You can just imagine that some of the guys that he grew up with would be saying, wait a second, is, is that a rule change? Did, did something change here? If we need Jesus to rescue us, if none of the works that we have been doing our whole lives are of any value, did the rules change? And, and you can understand that. You can get behind that because none of us like when rules change. Right? It's, it's, it's uncomfortable. It seems unfair. We have questions. It's like if I'm investing for my future and then tax laws change, suddenly the investments that I've been making are no longer good investments because there was a rule change. Or if I move into a community and the HOA gets together and meets and coming out of their meeting, they say, you can't have your, your pet panther in your backyard or whatever the case is, you guys know what I'm talking about, in those HOAs where the rules change. Like, I moved into this community and under this understanding, and now the rules have changed. It doesn't seem fair. Or if you've got uh, a job recently, and, and coming out of the COVID situation, you've got uh, an opportunity to work from home. So you take this job, you love this job, CEO comes out the next day and says, hey, from here on out, five days a week, you're going to be in the office the rules changed. Would I have entered into the agreement had the rules stayed the same? And so this comes across to us as kind of unfair, makes us uncomfortable. And so you can imagine that these Jewish people thinking of, of and been being taught for their whole life how to work their way into a relationship with God, now being told that that won't, that that won't work, that they need Jesus. They need Jesus to rescue. And so they're saying, did the rules change? And if they did, is that fair? Is that okay? And if he changed the rules now, what's to say he won't change the rules again? And so, so there's that confusion, there's that concern that he can see pushing back. But as Paul walks us through Romans chapter 4, I think that what we're going to see is that this is not a rule change. Paul is making his case, and I think that one of the things that we're going to take away from this is the idea that a path to a restored relationship with God, a path to a restored relationship with God has always led us to Jesus has always led us through Jesus, has always been with Jesus. God's plan, the path to the restored relationship, has always led us to Jesus. So we're going to pray, and we're going to dig into this Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Let's pray. God, we do love you, and Father, we are so thankful for your grace, for your mercy. Father, we're thankful for your word. Father, we're thankful that you are our firm foundation and that there is no change. Father, we are thankful that you keep your promise. And so, God, as we look into your word today, we ask that you would speak to us, that you would reveal yourself to us through your word and by your spirit. Father, we are thankful for your presence here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so here's Paul. He's in this courtroom mode, and he says, makes the point, salvation is found in Jesus. We have failed at our attempts at righteousness. We have done all the good works that we can, and we still come up short. There is no way any of us could keep the law and be perfect, and our relationship with God requires perfection. And so then the opposing counsel would ask, what about Abraham? We all know Abraham. Abraham's a big deal in the Jewish community. Abraham is the father of the Jewish community. Abraham is, is known as a friend of God. God made a covenant promise with Abraham, and Abraham was an example by which the Jewish people would live. So the, the, the Jewish people in Paul's context would say, what about Abraham? We, we know what happened to Jesus and we know when it happened. What was Abraham's option? What was Abraham's choice? How was Abraham found righteous? And so Paul says, that's a really good question. Let's use him as a case study. Let's talk through Abraham because we know his life very well. We know a lot about him. And in Romans 4, 1 through 12, he speaks a lot about him. And so in this case study, I think what we're going to see is that for Abraham and for us, we walk the path by faith alone. This path to a restored relationship with God is walked by faith. So the Jewish Christians, they would have relied on their works, everything that they've been taught, 
And when when Paul is talking about righteousness and standing before God, they would have kind of leaned back into their works relationship, into their works righteousness. And Paul is trying to draw them forward in the conversation. He wants them to lean forward, lean in to the conversation. So in verse 3, we see, For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So they ask, what about Abraham? Paul says, what does the Scripture say? Because Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. This is a quote from Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. This is what God is saying of Abraham. Because he believed God, God counted that as righteousness. So, so Paul is taking the Jewish people back to their book, back to the Torah, back to the law, back to the book that they knew very well, to talk about a guy that they knew very well. Many of them, the young men in the Jewish tradition, would have memorized the first five books of the Bible. They would have memorized the book of Genesis, which has all of Abraham's life. They, that, that would have been their conversation. They would have talked about that. They would have known him well. And so Paul was saying, let's go back to what you know. Let's go back to what you know of Abraham. And, and I think today we may not have all those details of Abraham's life, so we're, we're going to have kind of a flyover today, and we're going to see Abraham's walk. But Paul didn't have to present this to the people because they knew by heart Abraham's life, and they respected and they honored Abraham. So for our purposes, let's do this flyover. Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham. God speaks to Abraham. Abraham is leaving a comfortable place. Abraham is leaving everything that he knows. God tells Abraham, leave your people, leave your comfort, leave what's familiar, leave what you know, and start walking, and I'll tell you when to stop. God gives him intentionally a kind of a vague direction to show that Abraham has faith. And and, and we see it in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Abram and Abraham, I'm just going to use them interchangeably. He was, consider- he was called Abram up to a point, and then his name was changed to Abraham. Same guy. Bear with me on that. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and to him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed." So God is stating this covenant for Abraham. He's saying, this is what you're going to do. This is what I'm going to do. And what I need you to do is show your faith by just start walking. I'll tell you when to stop. Come with me. Walk along. So God's calling to Abraham demonstrated his faith. Called Abraham out of a place that was called Ur of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans were a people. It wasn't a huge people group, but they were really smart. They were very prone to war. They were good at, at battle. They, they, they really studied and understood astronomy, astrology. They were a wealthy people. They were smart people. They worshipped false gods. In fact, these people, the Chaldeans, would eventually kind of morph into the Babylonians. And we studied them a few, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, back in uh, Revelation. So we know a little bit about the Babylonians. The Chaldeans were a people group that, as the, as the Babylonians were becoming a world power, They were absorbing people groups. And and the Chaldeans were kind of an early one, sort of a lead in that. And they had influence and they had power because of their intelligence and their wealth. So you get just kind of an idea of what Abraham is coming from. A very different background than what God is calling him to. And he's telling him to leave that, leave all that you know. That place has been really good to him financially, socially. He's a powerful guy. And God says, leave that and follow me. Verse 3 said, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham's taking this walk shows us the faith that God knew, already knew existed. We see looking back that Abraham acted in this faith. God knew before he asked about Abraham's faith. And by the way, Abraham's faith, the faith that is necessary, is not a perfect faith. The, the Jewish people, and maybe sometimes we do when we look back at Abraham, we see him as, as this man of incredible faith, like superhero faith, like faith is his superpower, and I could never aspire to that. That that, that kind of faith is, is not like mine, and I'm not sure I could ever have the faith that he has. But what we see from his life is that that's not the case. He doesn't have a perfect faith. He has an honest faith. He, he has an obedient faith. His faith results in his movement, in his walking in obedience, and that's good, but his faith isn't perfect. 
When God made this covenant in chapter 12, we see uh, in, in verse 5, 1 through 3, God just made that covenant with them. And then in verse 5, Abraham's chance to show his faith, Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. God said, leave everything behind and go. And, and Abraham went, but he put kind of plan B in his pocket. He brought kind of a, a, a safety net, maybe. So, so he's trusting God. He's doing what God says, but he's thinking, God might need my help. Maybe God needs my help in, in the way this plan's going to work out. So he didn't perfectly obey and leave everything and walk away. He took some stuff with him. God's command was leave the country, leave the family, leave the trappings, leave the retirement account, even though you're 75 years old, and just start walking. And Abraham struggled with that. His faith wasn't perfect. And then as they, as a family, were traveling through Egypt, apparently Sarah was a nice-looking woman. Abraham said, when they see you and they find out that you're my wife, they're going to kill me and they're going to take you. He said, so, so as we're going through, tell them that you're my sister. Maybe at least they'll save my life then. And so here's Abraham. He, he's, he's setting up a lie because he's concerned about the place that God is sending him through. So, so it's not a perfect faith. He's kind of hedging his bet there just a little bit as he goes through Egypt. And a little bit later in the story, God promises Abraham that he's going to be the father of a great nation. And Abraham has no kids at the point, And he and Sarah are getting a little bit concerned. So they make a plan that involves Sarah's servant so, to make sure that Abraham has the son so that God can keep his promise. So, so he had faith in going. He trusted God. But then he gets to a place where it's like, maybe God needs my help. So all this to say, he is a man of faith. Yes, absolutely, and his faith results in action, and that's fantastic, but his faith is not perfect, and I think that's really good news for us. God is saying, start with the faith you've got. Take the step of obedience that I've put in front of you. As you walk in obedience, allow me to grow your faith. God is the source of faith, and he is perfectly faithful. And so he wants to grow your faith in this. He's not saying you have to have perfect faith to start, and I think Abraham is a good example of that. So Abraham is, is walking this relationship with God through faith alone. Not perfect faith, but the faith that he's got and the faith that will grow. All right, so walking by faith alone. Next we see that he walks by grace alone. So Abraham had to have the faith and he had to act on that faith, and that's good. But this plan is only possible by God's grace. God doesn't have to rescue anyone. God doesn't have to bring us rebellious sinners back into his presence. He would be just in not doing that, but by his grace, he gives an opportunity. He gives us a path, and that path is by his grace. So Abraham's got this faith, but it's by God's grace that that's even possible. Back to Romans 4, verses 4 and 5. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So man, by his best efforts, in his attempt to be in a relationship with God, he has messed up. He has sinned. I have sinned. I've rebelled against God. I've earned my wages. We'll see in a little bit, Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. If I work and receive my wages, I receive what I'm due. If I receive anything else, anything more, then that is a gift. It's a gift that, that starts with grace. And so the gift is nothing that we've earned, but God, by His grace, offers the gift. And this is totally dependent on Him. The fact that we can enter into this walk is totally dependent on His grace making it possible. And we see this again in Abraham's life. In Genesis chapter 12, we saw him make the, uh, the covenant promise to Abraham. And we'll see in Genesis chapter 15, um, God entering into that covenant through a covenant ceremony with him. So here's the picture. Old Testament times. When two people would enter into a covenant, a deep, meaningful, heavy covenant, there would be this ceremony, and God invites Abraham into this ceremony. He says, you're going to bring sacrificial animals from big down to small. So you're going to take those animals, you're going to cut them in half from nose to tail. You're going to lay those halves out on the ground. And then together, we're going to walk through this. And we will walk through this reciting the terms of the covenant. And the picture that's being painted is, if the covenant is broken because of me, I deserve the same. It's a gruesome picture. 
but showing the weight of the covenant. Somebody saying, if I break the covenant, if the covenant does not survive because of my efforts, I deserve to die. That's how I enter into this covenant. But look at what God does for him. Genesis chapter 15, verse 12. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Skip to 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your offspring I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. So here's this covenant ceremony that Abraham would have been familiar with and anybody else would have been familiar with. And God says, you know what, Abraham? Take a nap. You don't have to walk through this. In fact, you're walking through this wouldn't, it wouldn't make a difference because you're not going to be able to hold up this end of the covenant. God in his grace says, I will walk through. I will carry both sides of the covenant. If the covenant is broken, there must be death. I will cover that. God says, you can't bring anything to this covenant. I will do it all for you. God, by his grace, recognized that man had no capacity to uphold his side of the covenant. So God says, I got both sides. He says, when you fail, not, not if you fail, but when you fail, I'll hold up your side. I will keep this covenant. This covenant will be eternal because of me, because of what I bring to the table. And so God says there will be sacrifice, there will be bloodshed, but it won't be yours, it'll be mine. God says, I will uphold this. So this idea of grace, God doing this for us, a gift for us that we can't earn. We can kind of equate it to uh, an employment agreement. Like if you work and you have a boss, you're working under an employment agreement. If you do the work, you get paid. You get paid what you're due. You're not thankful to the boss for his grace and giving you your paycheck. You've earned that. There, there's, there's no grace in that. But if you don't do the work, you don't get paid. That's just, and nobody would argue with that. But with God, the way he keeps us in covenant, he says, if you do the work, you'll live. You've earned life. Be perfect and you can live. That's your, that's your wages. That, that's your due. There's no grace in that. You've earned it. But the reality is we don't. We don't do the work. We don't walk the perfect walk. We do sin against him. We rebel against him. And so we have earned death. But by God's grace, he says, you know what? You didn't do the work. I'll do the work for you. And I'll pay you too. And in fact, I'll pay you with benefits like vacation, overtime pay, a big bonus at the end of the year. God gives us life better than the life we could create on our own. He gives us more. Even though we've failed in the covenant, even though we didn't keep up our end, he said, I'll do the work and I will give you these great gifts. This is infinite grace from an infinitely gracious God. And so Abraham received this covenant blessing from God at God's expense. And that is God's grace. So let's go back to our courtroom in Romans 4, verses 9 and 10. Is this the blessing then only for the circumcised or also the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. So, so back to the ritual of circumcision. Here we have that as a seal of this covenant that God has made possible by his grace. And he said, you'll be marked as part of this covenant, as part of my people. And, and so here, the question then is, God's people are circumcised. Circumcision is a sign of God's people. Abraham was allowed into this covenant, was invited in, the way was made for him before he was circumcised. So the Jewish people see circumcision as an indicator of I do the works, I keep all the works, even this one. I'm doing all that I can. So, so their question would be, what about the uncircumcised people? And then Paul points out that Abraham, entering into this covenant relationship with God, was uncircumcised at the time. Not the means by which he entered in, but it happened later in chapter 17. It happened after this whole covenant ceremony, a time after. So this was a seal, this was a, recon a recognition, this was a mark of something that already happened. This was an outward display of something that had already happened between God and Abraham, this covenant relationship. And, and by the way, just a, a sidebar since we're in the, in the courtroom, not sure how we keep getting these circumcision passages. I feel like there's a meeting that goes on where, where the passages are assigned and I'm not invited to that meeting maybe. Um, but hey... 
God's Word. David shared it with me, so we're going to keep going. Just for clarification, though, circumcision sounds strange to us. People would ask, why that as a sign? Couldn't there be a, a tattoo, maybe a uniform, something like that? But the covenant of God, as we just read, is very intentionally generational. Right? The covenant of God speaks of his offspring, his many offspring, more offspring, more in his family than the sand on the ocean or the sand on the beach, more than the stars in the sky. He's speaking of a generation. He's saying the whole world will be blessed by me through you, my people. We're going to need more people. We need more people who worship God. This is a generational presentation. And so here's Abraham entering into this covenant with God, God leaning really into this multi-generational, ongoing, forever kingdom that he's building. And Abraham is thinking, huh, generations, offspring, where do offspring come? Oh, yeah. There's a reminder that this is a generational, that this is a gift that God has given generationally, that he has made available to all of us by his grace, that if we would walk in faith, we can enter into that too. It's a generational thing. This was a physical reminder for the Jewish men that, that theirs was not a blessing for today. It's a blessing for forever. It's not a blessing for them. It's for every person on earth. It is for all of the nations. And they would hear by God's people about God's goodness. And they would enter into that relationship with them. So this was a physical reminder. God's plan then and now and always has been has a heavy reliance on God's people raising up a godly generation who will worship God and tell other people resulting in them worshiping God. God's desire has been to fill the earth with people who worship the only one worthy of worship. And he will use his people to spread that. And that will require generations. So that is us entering into that covenant relationship. So circumcision was a reminder of what God had already done. Verse 11, Romans 4. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. This was a requirement for the Jewish people as a reminder of God entering into a relationship with them, is not a requirement to enter into the relationship. It's the relationship entered into. This is just a, a reminder, an indicator of that. Okay, so we see we walk this path by faith. We walk this path by grace. And finally, we see we walk this path with Christ. All right, so we are saved. We are in relationship with God by His grace through faith in Christ. And that is his plan, his purpose for us today and for all time. And so this covenant from Genesis 15 that happened more than 2,000 years before Jesus was born, how can Jesus be the means by which Abraham can enter into that covenant? How can Jesus be the means by which that relationship with God is restored when Jesus had not been born? When Abraham did not know the name of Jesus? So let's go back to the case study. Let's go back to Abraham's life. He's in this covenant relationship. He's got his boy. In Genesis chapter 22, God gives Abraham an order. Take your son, your only son, the son of promise, the son of the covenant, and sacrifice him. You're going to kill him. This is huge. After all this talk of the generational covenant, of the generational blessing, God says the generation that rides on this one kid, it's going to stop right here. Abraham, you're going to have to sacrifice your son. You're going to have to sacrifice the next one in line, leaving none. Abraham's 120 years old at this point. Prospects for more kids are getting pretty slim. But Abraham acts in faith. God, I don't understand. But God, you've carried me. You've rescued me. You've taught me. You've walked with me. You've spoken with me. I trust you. I'm going to do what you say. And he starts to move in obedience. So in Genesis chapter 22, he takes his only son and walks to the place that God told him and puts him on the altar. And folks, understand, Abraham's 120 years old here. Isaac was probably about 20 years old. Isaac is responding in faith. Isaac sees the faith of his father. Isaac could walk away. The 20-year-old's going to take the 120-year-old on any day. But he says, yes, Dad. As Abraham says, yes, Dad. As Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, said, yes, Dad. So here's Isaac on the altar, ready to be sacrificed, and God speaks. Genesis 22, 12 to 14, he said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. 
And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by, the, by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So Abraham steps out in faith, and, and for our purpose, we need to see that. We need to see the action that follows the faith. God already knew the faith of Abraham when he told him to do this. This is a demonstration for us. Show the people what it means to trust God, to walk in faith. And then when he did that, God offers a substitute. A sacrifice had to happen. A sacrifice had to happen on that day. There would be bloodshed. We broke covenant with God when we broke his law. When we sinned against him, when we rebel against him, we have earned death. There must be a sacrifice, and yet the substitute was given. And you see Abraham's response. I mean, here's this day where it's like every, the worst day ever. And then there's this ram, and, and Abraham says, look, God has provided a substitute. No, he didn't say that, did he? Go back and read that. The Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. It shall be provided. Abraham is recognizing that, yes, the substitute was given today, and that makes this a whole lot better day, but he's recognizing this is a promise. This is a covenant promise looking forward. On the mount of the Lord, God will provide. On the mountain of the Lord, God will offer a substitute to die in our place. And he has promised this, and when he promises this, it is a yes, and it's an Amen. He has promised salvation by the substitute. Cool fact. I wish we had more time to get into this, but I'm already running behind. The place where God tells Abraham to stop is a place called Moriah. Ancient name for this region. And this region would get a new name when a new people came and settled in the region, and it would be called Israel. And in the mountainous part of that, 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 that region, there would be a city built called Jerusalem. And on a neighboring mountain would be the place where Jesus would be crucified. On the mountain of the Lord, God will provide. In this very mountain, potentially, he's saying God will provide. God has made a promise, and Abraham is looking forward, and he's seeing that promise. You see, Abraham looks forward 2,000 years, believing the promise of God that one would be provided. If you think about it, here's Abraham 2,000 years before the birth of Christ, and he's looking forward, and he's trusting God. He's trusting God for the gift of the promise that God has made. He said, I believe the promise. I believe there will be a substitute. I believe there will be a way made. Here we are 2,000 years after the birth of Christ. We have witness. We have witness of his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension. We have this. We look back at the revealed promise of God. We're looking at Jesus on the cross for salvation. Abraham was looking at Jesus on the cross for salvation, but he didn't know his name yet. It was the gift, the promise that God gave Think about it. if you received a Christmas gift today from the person who knows you best, and he said, you can't open it till Christmas, but man, this is the best gift. This is exactly what you need. You probably don't even know you need it yet, but I know you need it, and I'm so excited to make this available to you. Are you excited to hold that gift? I mean, I, I want to open it, but I'll wait, but I'm excited because of who's given it to me in their excitement. We have the gift opened. The gift was Jesus. The gift that was placed before Abraham was Jesus, wrapped in wrapping paper of the law and the prophets and the temple and the sacrificial system. But the gift was there. The promise of God was there. He was like, I can't wait. But he couldn't open it. It wasn't revealed for him yet. For us, we see it. It's revealed. We're responding to the same gift that God has made available. It's just a gift revealed to us. He's looking forward with anticipation because of the one who gave the gift. We are looking back because we have the evidence, but you know what? We're looking forward too. There's more promises to come. There's an end to come that has nothing to do with a political system, with an economic system. It's got nothing to do with the physical world. It's got to do with the promise that God has made that he will restore his kingdom, a new heaven and a new earth. That promise, we have a glimpse of it, but it's still wrapped up. It's not been opened yet, so we get to practice the same faith Abraham did. As he looked forward to the gift, we can look forward to the gift. And we can celebrate the gift already opened, that is Jesus. So from the beginning, salvation, relationship with God, justification, your righteousness before God is by the grace of God alone, through your faith alone, in Christ alone. And that has always been the truth. 
And it will always be the truth. There is no wavering. There is no changes. This is not a rule change. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. Not a rule change, but the gift has been opened, and we get to celebrate that and live accordingly. And we should be excited because of the giver. So this gift is for God's people. It was wrapped for a long time. It's unwrapped now. But it has always been the means of rescue, the means of salvation. So the path to a restored relationship with God has always led to Jesus, has always pointed us to Jesus, has brought us to the feet of Jesus, and we walk to it with Jesus. So what then? What do we do with this? If you're not a Christ follower, a gift has been placed at your feet. Don't squander it. Take the opportunity. Talk to your friend. Talk, I'll, I'll be sitting down front here. We'll have the prayer team. T talk to one of our, our, our staff. Talk to somebody about this gift. But this gift has been placed before you. He made a way for you, and he brought you here to hear about it from his word, by his work. This has always been his plan. It's his plan for you. Ephesians 1, 4 and 5 says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Before creation took place, before the world was set into motion, God chose you to hear this good news, to hear this story, and to respond to it. He chose to save you in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world was set. Can you get excited about that? Don't walk away without unwrapping that gift. If you are a Christ follower, you are part of the covenant people, the promise that God made that every nation, he will bless you so that you will be a blessing to every nation, to every person on this earth. He has brought nations to your neighborhood. Be a blessing. Share this gift with them. He has sent some of you to their neighborhood. Be a blessing. Bring this gift to them. Leave this gift open before them. Reminding them that it is by the grace of God, through faith in Christ, that salvation is available. Share the gift. It was not given to you to sit on. It was given to you to give more. Let's pray. God, we love you. And Father, we are thankful for this gift. Father, we're thankful that you are the good and unchanging God. We are thankful that you make a promise, and that promise is eternal. Father, we're thankful that you carry the weight that we can't. Father, that you carry us. So Father, I ask that you would just speak to our hearts. Father, help us to take that step in faith, imperfect faith, but faith that pleases you and faith that leads us down that path, the path that finds its way through Jesus, the path to a restored relationship with you. God, thank you for your word and your spirit. Thank you for your presence here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Mark. So church, uh, would you come to your feet as we close out our time together? Um, let's declare as we leave that our hope will be found in Christ alone, that we'll find our strength in Christ alone, that we'll put our faith and trust in Christ alone, and that we'll live for and worship and honor Christ alone. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. When striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I sing. Oh, oh, oh. the world by darkness slain, then mercy forth in glorious day, up from the 
with the precious blood of God. Oh, 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 this is the power of Christ in me, singing out from life's first cry to final breath. Here it is. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man. i 